Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and sign up for a 30-day trial. Are you a next-generation entrepreneur? Form an LLC, register your trademark, and protect your products with LegalZoom. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but you can get personal advice from LegalZoom's network of independent attorneys in most states. Enter promo code TWIST in the referral box at checkout for $10 off. I am thrilled to follow up on our uh, Drones Week here on This Week in Startups and the launch of my new podcast, Inside Drones, with an interview and uh, some flying with Chris Anderson. Now, I know Chris Anderson because he was the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine. He became obsessed with drones, and he launched a company called 3D Robotics. It's now just called 3DR because they don't do robotics as much as they do drones. He is the android of drones. Basically, he's the open source community, and he builds a bunch of different drones that do things in cinema, beautiful cinematic shots that can be programmed and taped over and over again with his new technology. And we're going to hear all about the technology and the future of drones with Chris Anderson from his Berkeley headquarters of 3DR. It's an amazing uh, interview with amazing technology and amazing footage with an amazing entrepreneur. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and welcome to This Week in Startups. I am here at 3DR in Berkeley, California. Am I in Berkeley? You are. Uh, with Chris Anderson, who uh, many of you know from his previous gig, he was the editor-in-chief of Wired for what, a decade? 12 years. 12 years, amazing. And you were right there in the, the thick of it. 2001, got there right yes. after <laughs> And Complete was, disaster, the bottom. It was the absolute bottom. and um, What an exciting run. It was a great run. We had to um, first prove that there was a thing called the technology industry that wasn't a hoax. Yes. You remember that? I do, I do, yeah. And then um, figure out what was different about the technology post-bubble. Yep. And uh, the good news is that kind of believed in the internet, thought that the internet and Wall Street were two different things, and right. turned out to be right. Yeah, and there was something different about the second wave. What, what were the things that were different about that second wave than the first wave? Um, the well, actually, if you look at the underlying numbers, like adoptions, heart, heart adoption didn't change. Yep. You know, computer use, well, broadband use, phone use, it kind of you almost cannot see the dip. Um, you know, maybe some things got delayed by a couple of years, but actually, the great thing about the bubble is it created a huge amount of infrastructure, mm. dark fiber, you know, routers and things like that, right. um, and excess capacity. And then yeah. we just found good ways to fill it. Yeah, and then I'm watching you work at Wired, and you have a blog, DIY drones, and you start blogging on the side, and I'm like, wow. In, in he, fairness, it's, it was a social network, not a blog. Okay, the, the, social the, network. Big, big difference. Was it Ning-based? What was it? It was Ning-based. It was based. a Ning yeah, social network. It still network. is. It still yeah, is. Yeah, still is yeah. uh, the famous uh, social network in a box. So you started um, playing around yep. with the drones that are more like planes, like right. what we would traditionally think of a drone, not a quadcopter. And at some point, you realize this is going to be a business, and yes. you started 3DR. Well, there were a couple steps in between. Yeah, tell me, what, what, what exa- how did this exactly go from this like hobby that the editor of Wired's doing to now 3DR has raised over $100 million, you're selling thousands of dollar drones like by the truckloads and there's a bunch of offices and you're like making drones, yep. literally. Well, um, And I don't mean literally figuratively, I mean literally, literally. Yeah, yeah quite, quite literally. Um, so this is really, it, when people talk about the new hardware renaissance, right. that, that suddenly hardware, like consumer electronics and wearables, suddenly is starting to look like software. And what that means is that, is that it's quite easy to get into it. That mm. suddenly the tools and the underlying infrastructure are becoming available and cheap and powerful. Um, that's why it's possible for a magazine editor to now be, I think, the biggest drone maker in America within you know, two and a half years. Um, because it just the barriers to entry got lower in the same way that you know that Facebook that can start in a dorm room and end up a big media company in a small number of years you can start to do that with hardware as well so for us for me it was just a case of parenting gone horribly wrong I was trying to get my kids interested in technology he said let's build a robot out of Lego and they're like we did it boring let's yeah. fly a plane they did it boring and I'm like okay well 
that didn't go well. What would have been a cooler robot and a better flying plane? And I thought, well, let's get the robot to fly the plane. You know, that we did it on dining room table. It kind of almost worked. And uh, my children lost interest. And I'm like, it's kind of freaky that a dad and his kids can build a drone on the dining room table. What's going on here? It's kind of like a Blade Runner, like William Gibson novel all of a sudden. You know, I don't get chills very often. Yeah. You know, when I first saw the web, got chills. First time in China, got chills. First time you build a drone out of Lego on your dining room table, chills. Yeah, they're like, wow, I made something that can fly. Something in this world has changed. What is yeah. this? There's a glitch in the matrix. Um, so I set up this, this community, so uh, you know, um, DIY drones. And, and, and the, the important distinction between a blog and a community for me is that everybody had the, uh, the authorship tools. Anybody right. could post, anybody could get, create threads. And what happened is that it turns out a lot of people were getting chills at the same moment. It was, it, 2007 was the magic year. That was the year that the Wii controller came out. What's ah. the connection? The Wii controller had these accelerometers, and you'd move a thing in the world, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a pointer would move on the screen. You play tennis. So like, like the Fitbit guys, you yeah. know, James Park and team, they bought a Wii controller, and they're like, what else could you do with that? And the answer is Fitbit. Pedometer, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, that was the year that the uh, 3D printing started with the RepRap pro uh, program. It was the w year that Arduino started, the open source computing program. It was Which is basically a chip, a computer that's this big for 35 bucks. It was a computer that big for 35 bucks, but mo most importantly is that, is that you could, you know, you could, with a couple lines of not terribly complicated code, get an LED to blink. Now, what's so exciting about that? Well, what's exciting is that you can make something happen in the real world. Mm -hmm. And it starts with an LED, and then you sort of read a sensor, then you move a servo, and you're like, you're like, I actually was able to kind of, it was, it was like this moment when, you know, you know how like Tron, you like start in the world and you go into the screen? Yeah. Well, this is the opposite. You start in the screen and you go into the world. Right. And we, and it became possible to do physical computing. And that was Arduino made it easy. It was the Maker Faire and Make Magazine. Sure. Um, and there was, you know, the, it was the beginning of the Makers movement. Um, so for me, um, that was my entry point, Lego Mindstorms, yeah. which had sensors. And it allowed you to use sensors and, you know, use, I mean, children could do it. Yeah. Uh, so we started this community. And the community, a lot of other people were thinking about the same things. And they were thinking, well, you know, we could use these sensors and mm -hmm. computers to make aircraft fly. And um, everyone had an idea. And people started contributing. And they started designing drones together in the community. And I was like, awesome. I'm, I'm learning a lot. So glad that I created yeah. a forum for other people to, to work together. And that, I thought that was the end of it. I'm still the editor of Wired. It's a right. hobby. And um, it's, then the next generation comes along and they're like, totally amazing, these drone things. Um, wait, you need soldering irons? You need compilers? You need to have PCBs fabbed? Can I just buy one? And they're like, uh, I think we're going to have to start a company. Yeah. Because people just wanted to have the experience of flying it, not necessarily building it. Exactly, exactly. I was interested in building, but the next people just was, was like, you know, maybe it was just because flying robot sounds cool, or maybe they actually wanted to just get a video. Now, why did quadcopters become so pervasive so quickly? Because when we say drones, yeah. Technically, I think a drone means the flying ones that are bombing. A, no, a drone like the military. Mean, a, a drone, drone just means, means autonomous vehicle. Autonomous vehicle. A drone means actually it's not just it. it, it is it's called a um, a um, optionally piloted vehicle, mm -hmm. which is to say that you don't have to fly it. It can fly by itself. Now you may ah. choose to fly it. So that means GPS navigation, some form of artificial intelligence, the ability to navigate. Got it. And it could be a, it could be an airplane, it could be a, a, a copter of various sorts, it could be a traditional helicopter with one one blade or four or six or eight or whatever. Um, it can even you can argue that on some level even an autonomous rover or even a submarine yeah. could be a, a drone of some sort. So in the 80s and 90s or even 70s, I remember people had helicopters that ran on gas, mm -hmm. and then um, they were flying these gas-powered planes. Th that was like a very small hobby community. What role did the battery technology play in this? Yeah, there were there were sort of like three or four enabling technologies to change everything. Um, the first was lithium polymer batteries. So we went from NICADs to NIMH to lithium polymer, and you know, increasing energy density. So basically, a spin-off of laptops and, and phones. Uh, the second was brushless motors. Uh, what does that mean? Brushless motor is one. So, so traditional motors have these has brushes, these little sort of little um, metal things that touch the rotors and they spark and there's friction and things like that. Brushless motors ha are, con are controlled by a computer. Mm. And um, they're three-phase motors and they started with DVD drives. So ah. once again, a spin-off of the computer industry. 
Uh, the third enabling technology was digital radio. So the old ones were analog radios, um, and the new ones were spread spectrum, just like Wi-Fi. So another spin-off of the computer industry. And those, the connection was important because it gave you a little bit more dynamic or less latency? What, or? It, what it meant is that, um, first of all, it was a more reliable connection. And second uh -huh. of all, back in the old days, two people couldn't have the same frequency. Uh -huh. And so you're always getting interference from random dudes with radios. And now, in the same way, lots of Wi-Fi things can, with spe spread spectrum, they can coexist. Same thing. And the final thing was um, autopilots. So this right here is an autopilot. This hmm. is the brain for a plane, if you will. And an autopilot has got all the sensors and processing and software to fly an aircraft. Hmm. And what this means is you stick this in any vehicle and you don't need to pilot anymore. It'll fly itself. And so this made it, and uh, this is full of the same uh, MEM sensors, the gyroscopes and accelerometers and magnetometers that are in your phone. And the only reason this is possible is because sensors used to be physical things, um, are now have now become little tiny chips. Can I pause a second because I want to bring yeah. you a prop? Yeah, Okay. Go ahead. I'll, I'll be right back. Yeah. Hey, everybody, let me take a moment to thank our friends at Citrix GoToMeeting. I mean, gosh, think about all the time and money and hassle it takes to hold these meetings. My God, you're going down to the valley, up to San Francisco, uh, the traffic, the cost, the flying places. And my recommendation is that you meet your clients and coworkers over Citrix's GoToMeeting. It is a smarter way to meet, and it has beautiful HD faces amazing HD quality. I just did an all hands with my uh, team from inside.com and it was perfect. Everybody had crystal clear VoIP or they were dialing in and people were on different platforms. Some people were on their smartphones, some people were on tablets, some people were on desktop computers. And you know what? I have a real thing. I want everybody to have like a headset on and some people forgot their headsets and it still sounded really good. Uh, it's really the most professional uh, meeting project product on the market. It's very affordable. I've had it for many, many years. I think I'm close to a decade using GoToMeeting. And I want you to try it and sign up for GoToMeeting today. You'll get it free for 30 days. You have nothing to lose. So visit GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free button. And if you do it now, uh, your first meeting will be up and running uh, in just minutes. And that's GoToMeeting, and uh, your first 30 days are free. It's a fantastic product. You can also, it has a chat room in it, which is also a nice feature. Uh, I like to have somebody take notes and put it in the chat room. You can also record the audio from it in case you want to share that with everybody. And you know what? I do that as well. It's a fantastic product. Thank you, GoToMeeting. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, so what am I holding here? So that is a gyroscope from probably a cruise missile. It's a military. Um, that's kind of the state of the art about 10 years ago. 10 is, years ago. Yeah, well, so in the military stuff, still yeah. uses this. These are mechanical. There's a, a the spinning wheel in there, a gyroscope. And, yeah. and that's one axis. That's one gyroscope. You need three gyroscopes for the three axes. Right. You need three accelerometers. And every phone has these now. And you need three, you need, and you need three magnetometers. So you need nine of these. Those cost $10,000. So you need about $100,000 worth of sensors in something the size of a refrigerator right. to fly a military vehicle 10 years ago. And today, wow. that chip it has looks all of them. It like a, a small ant on your finger. Like a know? small ant on my finger. This yeah. chip has all of that plus a computer, and it costs about $4. It's amazing. So from $100,000 to $4, in from a refrigerator years. to something you can barely see on my, on my finger, in about 10 years. So you ask, how did drones suddenly become consumer products? Right. That's the answer. On the backs of a combination of the military, which got us to here, but really the smartphone, when exactly. a billion people get a smartphone, it's really going to drive down the economies of scale, the consumer electronics industry is what's, what's driven this down. So I, I, my, I call this the peace dividend of the smartphone wars. Yeah, for sure. That whatever yeah. Apple is buying today, we will buy tomorrow. Yeah, so the watch or whatever's in the watch or Everything. the screens, et cetera. So we use, I mean, basically, um, if you open up one of our drones, inside it you will find the same processors, things like Snapdragon, you know, Linux processors, the same sensors, the same sort of GPSs, the same sort of wireless uh, systems, often the same kind of cameras. So quadcopters became big for some reason. Where did that come from? Because I don't, it was almost like, Nobody had ever seen a quadcopter before. Yeah. And then they're everywhere. So quadcopters became... Did they became, exist for 20 years and we they just did, didn't know They about did them? not. So, oh, okay. so a quadcopter um, exists for a very specific reason, which is that it can, only, it can only be flown by a computer. Oh. A helicopter or an airplane can be flown by a human being. You can actually have physical linkages. This thing right here can only be flown because, because the way it works is that you have two propellers 
um, going in this direction, mm -hmm. counterclockwise, and two propellers going clockwise. And it just changes the speed of the various motors to do all the control. Now it changes it 400 times a second, and human beings can't move. 400 times a second. So this cannot be I'm flown manually. I'm starting to appreciate helicopter operators a lot more right now. Well, they, the big ones, they move yeah. much more slowly. They have these mechanical linkages that change the, the, the pitch. But these, these are all solid state. Basically, you just change the, the, the speed of the motors. Mm -hmm. So it can only be flown by wire. No, you can't, you can't, it can only be flown by a computer, because only right. a computer has the reaction time necessarily, necessary to do that. Right. And when did they first appear? And who had this idea? Is it it was, I mean, they, they, it had been speculated upon. They just couldn't do it until they had these kind of, you know, these, these, these autopilots. So it was about, um, I would say it's about early 2000, some of the first experiments in quadcopters came out. And um, it was around 2000 and maybe 9, 2000, 2010, when the first practical ones, you know, e easy enough to use, pretty reliable, came out. And the reason these are so these are so popular is first of all they're vertical takeoff and landing so you know you don't need to like an airplane you don't need to launch yeah, and land. Yeah, you can do it off your balcony. Um, second of all, because they're solid state devices, they only have four moving parts, just four movers, m motors rather. So they're quite they're quite simple. And then finally, because they are flown by computers, you don't need to be a skilled pilot. You just push a button and they take off. Now, um, the battery density to run these had to increase tremendously. How would this have been possible with the batteries from 10 years ago, or? Probably um, possible, but not, not really effective. So, you know, the battery technology has gone from, you know, from uh, NICADs, remember yeah. those with the gut memory, and then it was INMH, and that's probably when things started to get better. Now it's various forms of lithium, lithium polymer, lithium ion, etc. These are very dense, they're, and they're, they're dangerous. They're dense, and they're dangerous. Um, uh, you know, so that's why, you know, we've gone to batteries that are, they're smart batteries, and so these things have. Um, if I can open it up. These are these are not just batteries. They have batteries plus a lot of circuitry inside. Ah, so there's yeah. Yeah, so you know they they they're basically doing a lot of testing, exactly like the Tesla batteries. These are these are monitoring their performance all the time. Make and sure they're not going to overheat. Not gonna, exactly. You can't. <laughs> if they you, overheat, if you, you could have. Well, you could have a, a fire, and there yeah. have and there have been fires in the past. As a matter of fact, somebody fact, had one of these on a plane or something, and it went on fire, exploded. It or? did. There's been two instances that I know of. One um, that was in the cargo hold, and that's really bad. Yeah. Uh, another one yeah, the um, just, no just last week was up in, in the overhead um, compartment, and that. Um, oh, just last week, really? Yeah, yeah. and that, and that um, it was um, that one uh, caused uh, smoke. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of concern. Um, but um, they were able to put it out pretty quickly. And when you charge these, you put them in some kind of a bag or something to protect it? Not or? anymore. Not anymore? Not anymore. Now it's just like your phone. Got it. Um, and they, the energy density allows you to fly these things now going on 20 uh, minutes or something? More. This one's about 25 minutes. Uh, so safety's been a huge concern. Mm. Um, people get hit in the head with these things. Um, people don't know how to fly them. I mean, it's almost like giving people a Ferrari or something. Well, you know, not, not, like. not quite. Uh, maybe a Google autonomous Ferrari. <laughs> okay. So safety is the big focus of 3DR and the other competitors you have? Well, you know, I would say that um, it's been three phases. The first phase was just getting these things to fly in the first they place. They fly. Yeah, done. The second phase was making it easy to fly. Um, done, although, or getting there, it's always a work in progress, but actually the second step actually created a bigger problem with safety. Because back in the old days, and those, the, when you talk about the people with flying RC helicopters, they did things, at airports. They went at airports. They were trained. They had these buddy boxes. They were flight school checklists. There was this kind of culture of safety. Did they have to have a license back then, or no? Uh, no, you'd have to have a membership in an organization called AMA. Got it. Um, so back in the days, flying was hard, and you needed to be trained to do it. And as part of the training, there was this culture of safety. Then it, flying got easy. And these things just show up under the Christmas tree or whatever. Got it. You know, Christmas morning, you, you plug it in, you push a button, you expect to fly. And because we made them more sophisticated, the users become less sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And that culture of safety isn't ingrained. So now we made, them, we made them smart. We made them too smart. Interesting. So now we need to make them even smarter yet by making them not just easy to fly, but also safe to fly. Right. And that means knowing their surroundings, knowing that there's an airport over there or that, that, that uh, there are, there, you can't fly over your neighbor's lawn because that's invasion of privacy. Or maybe because your pilot is, is new, you shouldn't fly more than 100 feet away anyway. Ah, very interesting. So they got really easy to use, faster than maybe the culture exactly. uh, caught up to them. Reminds me of the Cirrus plane 
which came out with its own avionics. I don't know if you're aware of this plane. I do. So yeah. A bunch of friends who started flying these planes, they get so easy that they weren't rated for nighttime. But they're like, well, you know, it kind of feels like it's easy. So they started going at night. And That was the one with the parachute, right? It's the one with the parachute. And the parachute also gives you a whole another sense of... Absolutely. As I recall, uh, as I recall the parachute, um, which, will, which does in fact work. Um, yeah, it's worked a number of times. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, your, your plane's a write-off after that. For sure. It, it, it <laughs> explodes with gun powder to fire it yeah. and you will break a half million dollar million dollar plane but the avionics got so good that right. people who you know didn't think was, I mean people start to get a little too confident we call this um, enabling jackassery ah enabling jackassery <laughs> we, we have sadly enabled I mean you, you, as you know a drone went into the White House Yes. You're familiar with this case. You understand that somebody was drinking and flying a drone off a balcony at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's, what I, that's the kind of jackassery I'm talking about. Hey, everybody. Uh, let me just take a moment to thank at LegalZoom for sponsoring independent media like this week in startups. If you're starting a company or you've got a great new product, you can launch it and you can dream and protect all your ideas with LegalZoom. You can incorporate you can form an LLC, you can register your trademark, you can protect your products and services, you can apply for a patent, you can do trademark, copyright, and provisional patent applications. Now, it's not a law firm, but you can get personal advice from LegalZoom's network of independent attorneys in most states. It is a great way to get things done on the fly if you're a startup. And of course, uh, Jill, the Comet Bork from Rush Ticks, who is a launch incubator company, has been using LegalZoom for years for routine filings like trademarks and incorporations. And um, it's super inexpensive, and the flat rate is really easy on her budget. It's fast, and she can log in and see the status of her documents, and she knows she has a dedicated contact that's always available. It's really a smart choice for startups, so go ahead and enter the promo code TWIST for $10 off. LegalZoom.com and promo code TWIST in the reverb box at checkout and get that $10 off. Welcome to the program at LegalZoom. Thanks for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups, and everybody go do your trademarks and protect your products and services, incorporate, apply for patents, copyright, provisional patents, all that great stuff at LegalZoom, uh, and thank at LegalZoom on your Twitter handle. Use the promo code TWIST. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Now, there, there are some specific safety features that are being added. One of them I know is on descent. Because when you fly these things, just, you know, you could run them into something or you can just slam them down. Not how, anymore. Not anymore. So how do you keep people from slamming them into the ground? Yeah. And then what other safety features? So, the, you know, the old model of flying was that there was like stick and rudder and it actually correspond to... Just, you know, things like throttles and rudders, et cetera. And it's all fly-by-wire now. So, what does so it mean, fly-by-wire? Fly-by-wire means that you are not actually controlling anything directly. Instead, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're sort of um, you're, you're, you're revealing intention. I intend to go that way, and you, the computer, figure out what that actually means. Ah. So unlike a pilot who's like, hey, i got to put the flaps this way, i got to have the yoke this way, i got to need the speed, whatever. It's just like, go there. So your car is drive-by-wire, whether you know it or not. When you put your foot on the brake, you're not actually, you know, there's not a linkage connection to some brake pads. Right. There's an ABS system, and it's interpreting that. And increasingly... Um, and if you hit it hard, it does it in it, a pattern, it, right? It, it to takes, make sure it it takes control away from you. And as a matter of yeah. fact, you, know, you, you only think you're pushing on some brake thing. It's actually all, all servos and actuators. Um, increasingly, steering mm. is becoming, you know, drive-by-wire. So you're not actually, you're not turning some some gears right you're setting some signals that get translated through actually through software and actuators to drive the wheels and, and the more the cars become autonomous the more we're going to be sort of taking the metaphors of mm -hmm. actual driving and turning them into a got a ui for a computer right so it, in our case when you push in the old days when you brought the stick down the stick was the throttle right and you bring the throttle down to zero and it flies and it falls out of the air right um now the stick refers to altitude. Ah. And so we basically abstracted it and we say, okay, you want to come down? Fine. We'll come down on our terms. We'll come down slowly, we'll come down safely. And we know that, you know, that that ultimately you want to get to the ground and when we sense the ground, we'll stop. And how does it sense the ground now? Bump. Oh, by the bump. Yeah, it feels the bump. And I mean, it's got here. it's got barometric pressure sensors and a bunch of other ways to know the altitude, but they can drift. Um, and so basically we just go down, we go down fast till 10 meters, then we go down slow. And how do you know you're 10 meters above the ground? Barrows. So, the, what is that? The barometric pressure sensor. Got it. So it actually knows how far it is from the Earth? Well, yes and no. Yeah. Um, it turns out that, that altitude is like yeah. the hardest thing. Is it? So yeah. GPS is very good on the 
latitude and longitude, but terrible on altitude, right. plus or minus 30 meters. Well, that's um, not going to do you any good. That's not going to do you any good. Um, you got your barometric pressure sensor, but as you know, barometer, right. pressure changes, right? right? There's a cold front coming in, the pressure changed. And so it drifts over time, and also with temperature. Um, you've got things like your accelerometers that measure up and down motion, but they too don't know their absolute position. So we're now we're adding things like LIDAR, that, that like points a laser down, like laser ah. range finding. We have sonar that sends uh, signals down. We have what's called optical flow, which is cameras that are looking down. We can have radar from the cars uh, um, looking down. And we have feeling the bump. And there's a new feature that a lot of these have now, which is just come home. Come home, yeah, they all have that. Explain what come home is, because I think this is one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. Mm. Um, when flying them, if they go out of range. Yeah, geofencing. What does it mean exactly? I'm well, so, so first of all, we create, we create what's called a geofence, which is a bubble. Uh, around you, and this bubbles. This bubble is determined by a bunch of things. It's determined by um, FAA regulations, mm. visual line of sight, 400 feet. Um, it's determined often by things like, are you near an airport? You know, are there other sort of no-fly zones around you? It's determined by battery life. Mm -hmm. It's determined by things like like your radio connection. So if it knows I went so far away that the battery will not get me back. Precisely, it, it says, triggers. Hey. It, it it basically establishes a geofence, which is less than one half of your battery life. And if you if you if you breach that wall. It will then take over and come back home. And come back home means uses you remember remembers the GPS coordinates of your launch position, mm -hmm. and it'll come. It'll go up to a safe height, come back to you know at that height to your launch position, then slowly land itself. Genius. Now that's that's good. But here's what's better. So um, you know whenever it's flying autonomously, we have the problem of what's called sense and avoid, mm -hmm. which is let's. We can't. We shouldn't hit anything. We should be aware of our surroundings. Yeah, hitting so, a, a, anything with your drone is is the big uh, hitting, bummer. Hi, hitting things with a drone is, is is a bummer. If I um, if I tell you to you know walk to the the corner grocery, you're going to do a bunch of things. First of all, you're going to not fall over. Good. We can. We're good. We're, we're good at that. You know. Second of all, um, you have a vague sense. You got to go up the street, then you got to cross the street. You have vague sense of navigation, but that's not enough. You're also going to like not run to lampposts, and if there's pedestrians, you're going to you're going to wait for the traffic light, and maybe if it turns out like this light's red and this light's green, you're going to take a different route. That level of pathfinding is where is what real autonomy does, real intelligence. Right. And so let's say take something as simple as go home. Okay, so now I'm, let's imagine I'm flying, I shouldn't be flying in a city, but let's imagine I was flying in a city. And so I could say, um, I was flying, you know, I, I, was, I was flying, you know, around the building and went over here. Now let's say it decides to come home. It goes up to a certain level and goes crow's fly back home. Right, and through the building. Runs, and runs right into the skyscraper. Right. right, so that would be bad. Now, let, you definitely should not be flying in a city, so let's imagine you were in a forest yeah. doing that. So that's bad. What's better? Well, you know that it was a safe path to get there, so it's probably a safe path to retrace your steps coming back. Okay, so that's a smart return to home. It follows the path. Now you're sort of saying, okay. But it's not the most efficient. It's not the fastest. It's and not it the, could have changed. Not the, it could have changed. Like although a human being could have walked into the path. True. Yeah. True. But odds are you were yep. flying higher than human beings. And that, that so okay. once you're above 50 feet, things don't change very quickly. Yeah. Um, so now you start doing things like, okay, we got to calculate the battery life of the you know, sort of the distance mm -hmm. followed. And then we have to know. Well, it turns out that it was downwind going this way. It's going to take more battery ah. life to come back into the wind. So you have to calculate that. And Little. that's where we're talking to about AI. Right. Um, that's a very interesting observation. You're not going to run into anything. <laughs> things don't change above 50 feet. By and large. By and large. So autonomous cars have a real problem, which is things change all the time at the ground level. Once you get a, you know, above, above 50 feet, we have other problems, like um, you know, when we fail, we fall out of the sky. And wow. Which is Acceleration not. increases. Ex exactly. You know, sort of the, the uh, um, terminal are, velocity problem. How, many of, how often are they failing now? Because I've been seeing people flying these. And people are getting pretty damn cocky with them. I they saw are. somebody flying a large one over at the uh, Mission Dolores Kids Park. That would be naughty. And I was like, mm, yeah, not a great idea. Um, so they're failing um, st percentage wise, yeah. they're failing a lot less. Absolute numbers, they're failing a lot more. Because there's so many more in the market. So many more out How there. How many are out there now? About a million. A million drones are in the world right now. Depending of on consumer drones. The consumer drones, uh, depending on how you define. So. You know, the military makes drones, yeah. and those cost you know millions of dollars, etc. So what's interesting is that a company like ours, I think we make more drones every year than the military, the entire U.S. aerospace industry combined. Yeah, probably in history. 
probably. In I mean, history. they're making. What is it? What do those military drones cost these days? Ten million dollars. Well, like a global million? hawk is like something on the order of seventy million dollars. A predator is about five, six million dollars. So they're they're up there. So, let me ask a silly question. Perhaps we see um, the drones getting bigger or smaller or smaller. Both of these things are occurring. Battery life's increasing. The safety is getting amazing. And you can put cameras on them that way, and you can put a couple of pounds of payload. Two or three pounds of payload? Yeah, about. Is that the max now? Well, these things are typically optimized for a GoPro and a gimbal, so call that a pound. Okay. You can put more on. I mean, this is, uh, to, to get up, for, for example, we have another, yeah. another prop right here. This is a... Um, a huge one. This is, uh, yeah, this is a um, uh, industrial um, drone, and this one's designed to carry a... Um, uh, to carry a special zoom camera um, oh, wow. right here for, for track inspection. So the camera weighs a certain amount. The gimbal that carries it weighs more. And because we use, you know, high-powered motors and, you know, kind of overbuilt, it's the whole thing's... three thing, times bigger than this. I I exactly. And weighs that much more as well. Right. And costs even more than that. So um, are we going to be flying in these things in 10 or 20 or 30 years? Well, you know, I get that question a lot. And we already are. So when you fly an Airbus, mm -hmm. quiz, um, you're flying an Airbus from LA to New York. Mm -hmm. How many minutes of that flight do you think the pilots are flying? That's a great question. Um, Actual hands on the stick flying. I'm thinking it could be close to zero in some cases, right? It is. It's three minutes on average. Yeah. And what are those three minutes? You know, they choose to take off, typically. They just choose. They choose yeah, they, and, and sometimes they choose to land. Typically, all those landings that you're applauding, that was the autopilot. For sure. <laughs> it's the bump, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to be cruel to, 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 to pilots. But by and large, a modern air, um, Airbus can take off, fly, and land by itself. Right. Now, pilots may choose to do it for whatever reasons, possibly fun, possibly they, you know, they, they, they want it, they are, they are pilots, they, you know, you, yeah. they don't want to be spam in a can to use the, you know, the, the right yeah. stuff analogy. But um, you've been flying autonomous vehicles, flying in autonomous vehicles for a long time. And so you, this raises interesting questions like, you know, um, what are the pilots for? And, you know, we just had a, an incident where a human being crashed a plane. Yeah, somebody who was obviously depressed and was a suicide. Exactly, and so what, is the solution to that more pilots or less? And when something does go wrong, the pilots, sometimes there's literally nothing they can do. They're literally like flying without, once they lose hydraulics and they lose certain things, it can get really dicey. Well, we've had, you know, two scenarios. We had the, you know, the Captain Sully, you know, Sullenberg, um, you know, one amazing. where, where which was amazing. Um, landed but, in the Hudson. Land in the Hudson. Um, but, you know, um, you ask yourself, well, he had a Hudson to land to, yeah, land into. What if there was nothing but su suburbs? around that would yeah. not have gone as well yeah would he have known would he have known the surroundings well enough to know that you know where the cornfield was he, the hudson's pretty pretty observable was he apps actually right that he couldn't make it back to the airport or would a computer have known that he could have made it back to the airport yeah clearly the computer's got a lot of advantages the computer has more information now now there's a reason why we still have humans in the loop because the judgment question you know and, and sometimes computers can fail and sometimes so you know the question is does that human in the loop have to be in the cockpit or could they be on the ground? Right. Military drones are all flown by humans on the ground. Yeah, and in the case of the suicide, obviously the pilot was a liability, um, sadly. And Imagine if the ground were able to lock the pilot out and fly. Now, part of me says, you know, hooray, <laughs> you know, technology wins. And part of me says, gosh, that's kind of frightening. What if that got hacked? Yeah, if you could take that over. Now, the application of these things, um, obviously hobbyists, um, Obviously, military on the other end. There's got to be some stuff in between yeah. that's starting to happen. The commercial side. The commercial side is super exciting. Um, I have another prop uh, for you. Here we go. Uh, so this uh, this right here is a 3D print of the building. Looks familiar, yeah. The building right across the way is an adorable little uh, cement mixer um, right there. <laughs> so cute. Um, so that we did that with a drone. We scanned a building with a drone with one button. And we're going to do this after after yeah. you and I are down here. We're going to go out there. We're going to we're Jeez. going to pull up my phone and we're going to tap on the building. And the drone's going to go out. It's going to circle around. It's going to take pictures mm -hmm. and then it's going to send them up to the cloud. It's going to create a 3D render that's photorealistic and then we're going to 3D print it. That's a pretty amazing um, use case. And that's construction. That's you know um, uh, infrastructure, uh, architecture, mm. real estate. 
Then think about agriculture. You know, you and I live in California, and water is a huge problem here. That yeah. we're in this drought. Eighty percent of the water in California is used by agriculture, and some significant fraction of that is wasted. Yeah, it could be an equal amount wasted to be used. We don't actually know. So, so there's two kinds of wasting. Um, you know, one is that um, we're using more water than we need overall because we just don't understand what the plant needs are, and the other is that we. We're actually just leaking irrigation. There's right. a ton of leaking irrigation. Farms are so big that it's actually quite hard to spot that. So people tend to use too much water because the consequence of using too, la too little is bad. Yeah. Drones are fantastic at spotting water. You just go right over and see water and in the, So your, your regular camera they has, a, has a, something called an infrared filter in it. If you take that infrared filter out, it's a little piece of plastic, if you take that filter out, suddenly that regular camera, the camera on your phone or a GoPro can see water. It can see water shows up really well in the near infrared. And you can just immediately, so what looks like two plots of ground that on ground level look like the same color, when you pull up and go through, through the near infrared, you can actually see that one bit's darker than the other, and that's where the leak in the irrigation is. But it's soaked right in, right, soaked down a few inches, so you can't see it at surface level, but when you pull up, you can spot it. And it seems like Hollywood and photography is gonna be huge. Wedding photography obviously is happening already. Um, I was just selling my home and one of the brokers, his pitch to me was, we're going to make an amazing drone video of your home in Los Angeles. Slightly illegal. Is it? Yeah? Yeah. How is, why is that illegal? It's uh, my co house. The commercial use of uh, UAVs is not allowed in the United States at the moment without certain exemptions, which uh, are hard to get. So I could do it myself and you put it, it on a website. Because he charged money for the service, it's commercial use. Oh yeah, so um, I was just thinking, he uh, said he was going to do it for free. Mm. His brother was gonna do it for yeah, free. Yeah, exactly. And I was going to buy him a $500 lunch. Right, exactly. Um, but that's occurring like crazy now. It is, and just imagine what's gonna happen when it really is legal. <laughs> yeah, and then Hollywood has an exemption or no? A Hollywood, um, a certain Hollywood studios ha have an exemption. Um, um, it's a little bit of a two-edged sword. On one hand, they found they, it's absolutely legal. On the other hand, um, the condition of getting that exemption is things like uh, manned pilots. I mean, sorry, uh, you know, people with pilots' licenses, um, cleared sets. You know, there's a bunch of really tough restrictions. Oh, they can't fly it actually over the factors or do interesting things. I'm not sure exactly. They, they yeah. were pretty restrictive. So the, what's the state of the law now? I mean, I saw something came out where the FAA was like, you, you can do it, but the state of the law right now is that recreational use is the GoPro thing. You and me yeah. doing it is fine under 400 feet within visual line of sight, away from built-up areas. Okay, under 400 feet. Under 400 feet. So Which that is 40 that, stories. It's it's plenty high enough, and the reason is because manned aircraft is a thousand and up, and you want a buffer zone, and then you have you know kites and radio control models and things like that. Um, so that's totally doable. Um, commercial use was not allowed unless you got a special exemption, which is hard to get. Um, now, it's a little weird that you would let my children fly drones, but not trained professionals. But that it's is weird. kind of where we found ourselves. Uh, largely on the grounds so that it's very hard to send my children to cease and desist, but it's very easy to send a company to cease Correct. and desist. Correct. Got it. Um, and but things are better. These drones, though, can fly higher. They can, they can absolutely fly higher. They can fly longer. Um, What's are, the radio... What's the gating factor for how high they can get? It is get? absolutely not the radio. These things don't need a radio connection. Remember, they are autonomous. Right. Once they have the GPS waypoints, they can go, they can, they, they've flown across the Atlantic. What? Yep. Uh, like 15 years ago. Crazy. This one This one guy, uh, Maynard, somebody. A other. drone, not a quadcopter. A drone, drone a plane. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, both, they're both drones, mm -hmm. um, but a but a fixed wing. Yeah, okay. Drone. So a fixed wing drone. Right, flew across the Atlantic. I'm getting the, the language now. I know, it's, it's tricky. Even the word robot is a little ill defined. It's gonna be, it's like, you know what's going to happen is this video is going to be watched like 10 years ago from now, and it's going to be like that Today Show when they're talking about the mm -hmm. internet. And yes. they're like, how does it? How does the internet work? A network and of tubes. It's a and it's just going to be. I'm going to be embarrassing myself. But like the drones, right? Like the quadcopters with the wings, that without the wings. But um, how we were, high can a quadcopter go? Um, the, very, the ones very, that I can buy in the store and yours and stuff. Thousand, thousands, thousands of feet. Two, three, four, five thousand. Sure. Wow. But that would be very, very bad. You should totally not do that. And we, and we, ours, ours have a limit. Of 400 feet. So, we, so if you go above that limit, it'll just hit the geofence, breach the geofence, and come down. I'm now, assuming people can turn this stuff off. They can hack it. It's software. Yes, they yes. can. It is up to them. Like, and if they were on private property or in another place, still 400 feet. Still 400 feet. So, remember, you know, the United States. Yeah, I mean, jetliners and manned aviation can fly over anywhere. What about the water? The and flying over the ocean and stuff like that. Because I'm seeing a lot of very cool ones where they're like 
hovering over whales and dolphins and um, orcas. Um, this, the regs are federal and they're based on the national airspace, which extends to, I don't know, 10, ah. 10 miles offshore or whatever. Got it. So you can do anything you want after that. Where will this technology be in 10 years if we keep at this pace? Because you said 10 years ago, yeah. you know, we just started to see, you know, well, so the reg your kitchen table with your Legos. Um, let me pause. I want to bring another prop. Sure. So where will this be in 10 years? I mean, it's been an incredible journey for you personally from hobbyists, mm. Lego Minecraft, all this other stuff, to now you've got a company that raised over $100 million. I'm assuming this company is doing tens of millions of dollars in revenue or something. How many employees? 300. 300 employees at 3DR. You have some factory in Mexico or something? Tijuana Drone Factory, great name for a band. Tijuana Drone Factory. Why Tijuana? My co-founder, um, well, first of all, Totally random. My co-founder, who's I mean, most I understand Mexico. Person. I don't understand that specifically Tijuana. Well, Tijuana is the um, electronics manufacturing center of North America. It is the Shenzhen of North America. It is the Akihabara. All the, no, the all, Shenzhen. Shenzhen. Yeah, all of the flat screens you have. If you go to the back, they say "Made in Mexico." They mean "Made in Tijuana." Wow, Tijuana is super cool. Not dangerous. <laughs> I have never been. You should go. Okay, yeah. so ten years from now. So ten years from now. Um, so we are. Um, and by the way, it just got even more like a William Gibson novel yeah, that we're did. sitting here and you're like, yeah, no, no, of course we're making them in Tijuana. A and Shenzhen. Of course. And Shenzhen. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's like the Tijuana Shenzhen. I mean, we're going to be speaking Changlish in a minute. It's going to be like the guy <laughs> in Blade Runner who is the I, Edward J. Momo's character. Chanish. This is Chinese Spanish. Chinese Spanish. Ch Chanish, English Changlish. is. Oh, right. It's not Changlish. It's Chinese Spanish. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing that Blade Runner got that right? They're like, we're going to mix Chinese Spanish and English. Uh, and then Japanese. It's pretty amazing. How the only thing they got wrong the was that is that in the future it's going to be very rainy rather than very dry. But the rest was right. That, yeah. Well, we'll see with global warming what happens. That's right. They they were they were on the acid rain trip, I think. Yeah. They were like it's going to be acid rain, which was. Anyway, so we yes. so back so to the back, years, they back to the future. Um, in the future. So, so the two future. things. First of all, you know, I, you brought up the regulations, and the, yeah. the good news is that things are going in the right direction. So, commercial use um, is uh, the FAA said commercial use will be allowed. You won't need a pilot's license, visual line of sight, you know, no, no aircraft certification. So that's going really well. So you're going to see, you're going to go past farms, and these things, drones will be buzzing over farms. Just that's just part of the landscape. Yeah, it's just, they, those are crop mappers, of course. Just the way you see crop dusters today, you see crop mappers tomorrow. For sure. Um, in terms of the physical things, so, so today we're here. We're this size, and we're this size because it carries a GoPro. Um, you now, there are also drones that are this size. Now, this size is, this is a Bebop for parrots. It's a, not our drone, but I really yeah. like it. Um, what, I, what I like about it is that it's... Um, oh, the camera's in here. The camera's in there. Yeah. And um, the it's, it's got a fisheye lens, and it does what's called digital stabilization. So yeah. rather than mechanical stabilization with a gimbal yeah. like we have on these, these, does it all, these do it all solid state. They turn hardware into software which is the right way to go. Now, the quality is not as good as a GoPro, but someday it will be. And this thing, this thing doesn't hurt as much when it hits you on the head, right? Yeah, it's a pound. You can pack this one in your backpack, whereas, whereas this one's a bit harder. But, but wait, let's not stop there. Because I own a little one. I forgot the name of it. It's the D90 or something. Yeah, I don't know. It's like this little Simon cheap one. Like it costs 100 bucks, uh, well, and it's unflyable. And it's unflyable, exactly. So, so then they get to this size. And on this size, you know, th these are, these are um, uh, you yeah, know, they can carry a camera. It's pretty wobbly. The range isn't great. The battery life isn't great. And then you can go even smaller to something like this size, which is probably whoa, the whoa, one you Whoa, whoa, I've never seen. No, know. I have this one, this size. Yeah. This is like in the palm of your hand. Right, so now we're talking insect-sized. This is like James Bond level stuff. Exactly. So now these don't carry cameras, but they could. And what happens if you take the digital stabilization quality of smartphones yeah. and start to put it on something this size? Now you're getting insect-like size. Um, if I could throw this at you, boom. Boom. It doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. Correct. Safety becomes less of an issue. It's all about the kinetic energy. And you could throw it away. And you could throw it away. Or you could if send, out a, th send yeah. out a thousand and let them, you know, have 900 come back and call it a success. You could actually take these and put solar on them of some type. Well, solar solar needs area. A bigger area. Yeah, exactly. Maybe it could fan out or something. Well, they, they've had these things that perch on power lines. And oh, just, really? Yeah, and just sort of parasitically soak, soak up the electricity. That now we're really getting into futuristic things. So you think smaller? I think smaller. Smaller, cheaper, better, faster, you know, the usual. Yeah, the smaller is going to be fascinating. Now, this also changes use case. Right. Right. Well, so so the smaller, so basically the use case today for, for consumer is video. This is the golden age of personal storytelling. We just basically, you know, between the, you know, the periscopes and the meerkats and the vines and the selfies YouTubes, et cetera, and selfies, et cetera. Selfie culture. Yeah, we, 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 want, we want more Hollywood quality cinematic 
documentation, video, of, documentation our of, of, of our lives. And the better, you know, the whole GoPro story is be a hero, right? Right. You know, I'm not an extreme skier, but you know, with the right GoPro angle, I might sure. look like one. Yeah, it'd be pretty amazing. <laughs> so these things are basically taking the Hollywood tool kit and bringing them to regular people. Right. Now, in the past, you had to be the photographer. You had to actually be flying these. But what if you become the actor? What, in ah. what instead of flying it, looking at somebody else, it's flying and looking at you. And they can follow you around. And, and we're kind of on the, we're on the verge of that happening. A couple they, of people are working on that. Ours do it right now. Yeah. So you could be going for a walk and it would follow you or run or it something. Do, it does all that. It follows yeah. you, but it doesn't just follow you. It also picks camera angles. Ah. Imagine you're a kite surfer right now. It, you know, you know what the great angle is. It has to be, first of all, following you. It should be ideally in front of you looking at your face. Remember the, si the sun, you should be the, it should be between you and the sun. Right. Um, if you're a kite surfer and there's wind, so there's a kite, you don't want to be the ki have the kite in the way, so you need to be on the other side. Wow. So all of those things, plus the cinematic angles and the sweeps and reveals and all that, it's just software. We You'll can just do that. Do. We can do that. You'll be like, Richard Branson will be out there kite surfing and be like, let me get a shot of this. Something will take off from his check. Richard face. Branson is an investor. Is an investor in 3DR. He and, is, yeah. and if you will not, you if you go to the Necker YouTube, Island, YouTube everywhere, you will see our video from Necker Island of Richard uh, Branson kite surfing. Really? Yep. Okay. So, um, and these smaller ones, are we going to see, like every other vehicle on the planet, trains, um, cars have their own drones built into them to do like a head stuff or? I don't think everyone um, yeah. trains for sure. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, there's uh, there's definitely a case where you want to be able to do inspection ahead of you. Maybe um, you want to be able to do inspection behind you in case the train stops and you're worried that some train robber has yeah. has you know has is 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 plundering the cargo. Um, so you can imagine the trains would do it. Yeah. But there's also the notion of something we've started called the scan van. Um, huh. And a scan van is just a van with a drone in it that can go from construction sites and just basically hatch opens, drone Pull takes open, off, boom. Scans the area, does the processing right there on the spot. Got it. And security, will that be a big thing? Like Super big, yeah. Yeah. So the ability to do a perimeter, so we have fences, we have you know security cameras, but the ability to have a, a drone with infrared you know, cameras, by the way, that can patrol the perimeter automatically, landing, charging, etc. You know, things you can see from the air. Yeah. It's just better security. Now the latest version that um, we're gonna see outside hmm. is called what? It's called Solo. Solo. Yep. Okay, so you pick the name Solo because you it'll it'll fly by itself. You don't need a you don't need a pilot, you don't need a photographer, you don't need a two operator thing. It's 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 autonomous. It's a drone. And what you showed me before was you could pick two different points in space and different camera angles right. and then just slide back and forth between them like you're on a wire. It, like a cable cam. Like a exactly. Cable cam. So basically you fly to one point, click, you fly to another point, click. And it will just remember that, and it will automatically, you wrote a repeatedly. Macro. Yeah. Wrote a macro, but, but think about how much, I mean, first of all, let's think of the Hollywood application. Think of how much of Hollywood is these pre-scripted scenes. Sure. Everything's timed to the moment. The yeah. camera must be in the right place at the right time. We basically made cameras robotic and totally repeatable and predictable. Right. They, they're like, they were on rails, like on a cable. But now that's not just for Hollywood, it's for you. So, you know, imagine if you could look at the 10 or 20 greatest aerial shots in in film history right shining or whatever shining. Yeah. and they, each one of those is you know you want that shining shot B boom you get the shining shot that's a combination come in and sweep around you know or, or whatever that 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 ability to to operate not only the vehicle in three-dimensional space and the orientation but also keeping the camera focused on it and the zoom or whatever mm. i mean we don't have enough hands to do that manually yeah. but for a robot it's easy and we'll be having these in our homes, flying around in our homes, do you think, indoor use or no, for these little tiny ones? I uh, doubtful. I mean, there's been some thought about using them for, you know, for security, in, yeah. in, indoor security, you know, when you're not home, A you know, to patrol. be able to kind of just, yeah, to patrol the home. Fascinating. Um, and we have to figure out, I guess, all the use cases. Where, if we were to put this, like, against computing, right, we saw computing start in the 60s and 70s, mainframes, sometime in the 80s we got the actual PC, mm -hmm. and then obviously laptops, and then on to the mobile phones. Where are we in that? If that was a 40-year arc. With drones, yeah. where drones were, were somewhere between the Apple II and the Macintosh. Got it. Um, I think basically we've, the, we've introduced the notion of a personal drone, like the Apple introduced the personal computer. We've made it um, useful. We've come up with a couple applications like VisiCalc or whatever. Yep. Um, I don't think we've quite hit our Macintosh moment. 
Right. You know, where we where it's you know completely transformative experience. You know, the graphic user interface, the mouse, etc. I think we probably will over the next year. I hope Solo will be in fact the Macintosh moment. And then after the Macintosh came, you know, the apps, you know, the desktop publishing and the other things we started doing with it, video games, the internet, the web, and then uh, then the yeah, next I mean, thing the was the internet was arguably as big as the PC itself. Yeah. So so from a from a um, from a computering analogy, I think we're just hitting our Macintosh moment, which would put us at 1984. Wow. It's not going to, I think it's going to accelerate much faster. For, um, among other reasons, we, we don't have to invent all this from scratch. We can just inherit the infrastructure of the internet and the smartphone. Okay. So, you know, we, we don't have to invent everything in here. Apple is very happy to do it for us. And that's, I mean, that is the controller of a lot of these drones, right? This is the controller, yeah. So this is, so, you know, fundamentally these drones are cameras in the sky, and the interface is a camera. You know, you put them there, you now see the scene from the drone, pinch and zoom, tilt, whatever. It's, you know, we, we get that. And it's a connected device. And there's been a, re the, the most powerful change in consumer products is the notion of connected products, where things get, get better over time. Your mm -hmm. phone gets better. Every, every day, there's updates. Your Tesla, you've got a Tesla, right? Oh, yeah. It gets better, what, every every week, every month? It's like, yeah, I think about every six weeks, they come out with some pack, but it comes with like 20 things. So remember back in the day, there was this planned obsolescence. You buy something and it just loses yeah. value overnight. What's the opposite of planned, planned obsolescence? It's just Pl feature delight. <laughs> planned improvement. Yeah. You know, these drones are now connected devices. These are part of the Internet of Things. They are connected to your phone, and your phone is connected to the cloud. And whatever you buy, whatever they do when you buy them, they'll do more the next day. It's really interesting when science fiction becomes indistinguishable from reality. I mean, these things will be lifeguards at some point in our sure. lifetime. They'll be... They'll be your, 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 these are the droids you're looking for. These are your pet... All right, so what about the Amazon robo cameras? Thing? Let me ask you about that, because that... People say that was just... And we both know Bezos. Is Bezos an investor in your company or no? Uh, not directly, through a fund. Oh, through his fund? Through a fund. Through a fund. That he, oh, oh, okay. So he's a little bit removed. Now, what's going on with his drones? Are you participating in that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yeah, you're so helping him with the drone delivery. Uh, without getting... Without Getting Breaking in, um, NDAs. Yeah, so um, you know they they uh, they use our technology, but we're also um, quite. So that's real. He's really oh, thinking yeah. of doing that. Yes. Well, we'll we'll define that. Okay. A, a little, um, but we're also um, uh, quite quite publicly partners through some, something called the Small UAV Coalition, which is mm. a group of it's us and Google and Amazon and GoPro and companies like that and DJI, mm. who are working um, on the regulatory side to allow, you know, to make it safe and responsible to integrate these things. Um, so they are absolutely doing that, um, and th there is, you know, so delivery ranges from. So the videos you saw is warehouse to home. Now right. warehouse to home is pretty hard, but there's a lot of things you can do before warehouse up to home. There's warehouse to warehouse. Sure. There's warehouse to drop off box. Mm -hmm. So on the top of an apartment building, you could easily have a drone zone drop off box shielded, nobody around there. You know, the drone comes. Sure. You, oh, that's a really great idea. So you could that that, that could you could just define the zone as being a drone zone. And, you know, you'd say, we're not going to fly in bushes, we're not going to fly near the ground, we're not going to, you know, fly near kids or On dogs. On top of this 30-story building yeah. is a caged-in area right. where you go pick up your mail. There's, there's places in Europe right now where DHL and others have um, these boxes where you dry, have pack, packages that are dropped off, you all have a code, mm -hmm. you have your own code to the box. And uh, the idea of, a, um, of uh, delivery boxes, I mean, we have mail boxes, right? But sure. the idea of smart delivery boxes is now conventional. Yeah, that would be relatively easy to do in the next five years or so. It would, it would be easy, it would be very easy to be able to uh, to be able to take a package, say 10 miles, yeah. and drop it off on a designated drop-off zone on top of the building. But the weight would be the key issue. You have to be small. Bank. It turns out that something like 80% of Amazon's packages are under a pound. That's fascinating. I'm, you know, maybe the number is 76%, but I, it's, it's much higher than you would think. So that's actually going to happen in our lifetime, for sure. And then it's pot delivery, don't forget that. That won't be an Amazon product. That will be, yeah. That'll be. I have a feeling they're just going to follow you around. R robot drug drug mules. Yeah. <laughs> well, as people have been doing that over, I heard that they have. that might be a legend or urban legend. Uh, you know, it's a, it's probably eighty percent legend, but not hundred percent legend. Uh, so people have certainly uh, used uh, drones to drop drugs over prison walls. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Um, certainly, uh, n the uh, medicinal drugs in Africa, yeah. things like you know, things like uh, vaccines or penicillin, things like well, that. Well, the roads are washed out. Or the, or the roads, roads are washed just out. That's dangerous. That makes it. That makes perfect that's sense. A, that's a no-brainer. Right. What are the crazy things people have done with drones? Like, what are the stories you guys talk Where about? Where do like? I start? Yeah. What are the most regrettable ones that you're just like, oh my god, SMH? Ah. Uh, I'm shaking my head, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. Any kind of you know, flying over. 
cities, you know, New York, Manhattan. And he guy threw a, flew one into a building off of his... Yeah, yeah. Fl flying off balconies in Manhattan is about the dumbest thing you can do. With the second, the second dumbest thing being flying off a balcony in Washington, D.C. and ending up in the White House. Yeah, I mean, people, nobody's died from a drone hitting them, or has that happened, actually? Nobody has died, as far as I know, yeah. I mean, aside from the military thing. Yeah, well, that, Hellfire missiles designed to kill and people, designing, yeah. But as far as I know, nobody has ever died from a consumer drone hitting them. But people have gotten stitches. People have gotten whacked. People have gotten stitches. You know, I've had, I've had my share of scrapes. And people have definitely been killed by radio control helicopters. Um, yes. Those things will chop your head off. Those things are scary. Much scarier than those a quadcopter. Those things should not be allowed. That's just crazy. Typically, typically they, they kill themselves rather than other people. That's but there what happened, been, right? Some famous guy killed himself. There have been instances where, where spectators have been killed. That's scary. Yeah, huge blades. All right, let's go find some drugs. Okay.